Hello. Oh, it is recording. I see the little figure. Okay, great. I will do my little spiel and then I'll introduce you. Nice. Okay, here I go. Hi, I'm Sue from the Salves and Mind Room Research Centre at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, we are recording a podcast during lockdown about developmental psychology, uh, which seems to be a really interesting topic to be thinking about right now. And today's psychological is with Jenny Gibson from the University of Cambridge. And she's going to be talking to me about children's pretend play. Hello, Jenny. How are you doing? Hi, Sue. I'm well, thanks. Good. Thank you for coming on our podcast. Thanks for having me. Um, so tell me, what did you discover in this particular study we're talking about today? So we discovered that children's pretend play interactions with each other are more complex and nuanced than you might um, at first thought think, um, and certainly more complex than perhaps some previous research has suggested. So we found that um, when children were playing with their friend in a plan pretend play scenario, they tended to spend about 8% of that time in character pretending to be someone else. And the rest of that time is spent doing other things um, associated with pretend play behavior, like setting the scene, assigning roles, um, and trying to get the other person on board in play. And also we found that, um, uh, what did we find? Oh yeah, so we found that um, individual differences in children, so their individual abilities in uh, language skills, for example, only explains a tiny proportion of the um, variability in pretend play skills. Much more variance was explained um, by the dyad, the peer that they were playing with. So um, I guess the headline is that pretend play is very much a social affair. Oh, great headline. Um, that's lovely. And and feel very familiar. Whenever I've tried to do pretend play with my kids, I feel like most of the time they're out of character and giving me instructions about everything mm -hmm. I'm doing wrong within the game, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so what motivated you to study this? You said previous research had maybe um, not captured this kind of detail. So was that really what, what you set out to do, was to look at it in more detail? Or was there, what was the the, the, the thing that got you started? Well, there have been lots of important theories proposing links between children's play skills and their social development. And lots of them are kind of still at the very much theoretical stage or the sort of anecdotal evidence. So people talking about potential link between um, children's play skills and their social adjustment and their mental health. But when we actually looked into the research evidence that's empirical, so that's been based on data collected out in the real world, there's actually very few findings, and what is out there is quite messy and contradictory. So in this study, we wanted to go back to a very fundamental stage and just ask, what do children do when they're engaged in pretend play with each other, and how is that related to other skills? So this study is kind of a first step in answering that question, and it's part of a much bigger study that will look at those um, questions over time as well, so we can move beyond um, correlational data where we're taking children's skills and abilities and linking them at one point in time, but we'll actually be able to see how that pre predicts their future development as well. Mm. That's so interesting and so important, that longitudinal point of view, I think. Um, so how, how did you go about collecting these kind of examples of pretend play? Well, it's quite good fun being a, a pretend play researcher. So we had to um, get some toys that we knew would stimulate um, pretend play behavior and do it relatively quickly because there's sort of practical considerations as well. So we worked with schools around the Cambridge area who wanted to help us with our research. And we, um, we got 244 children and we paired them up according to who they told us they liked to play with or who the teacher thought would be a good match for a play pair. Mm -hmm. And then we had research assistants that took them out of the classroom. So these kids were in reception, that's um, age four to six years in the UK, well, in England specifically. Um, and then the research assistant took them to a quiet room. Um, the toys were in there already, so it was a, a Playmobil set it was either a Playmobil castle or a Playmobil zoo. And we picked out these toys based on some 
I was seeing um, suggested they were good toys for getting that age group really engaged and engrossed in play. And then our research assistant um, pretended she'd forgotten something and she left the room. And then we just watched what happened. So we recorded it on two video cameras um, for around about 10 minutes. Um, I think once we'd kind of um, edited the videos, it ended up about eight minutes per child. Mm, that's amazing. And how quick was it for them to start getting stuck into pretend play? It's almost immediate. You know, for a couple of children, there was a bit of exploration of the cameras, which of course is probably playful as well. Yeah. Um, but the toys are just like a, a magnet and they really did get stuck in very, very quickly to engaging with the toys. And actually in some of the piloting phase, we'd tested out whether we needed to give an instruction to say to give permission to say you can play with these things but actually um, they really didn't need it. the environment and having the toys there is enough of an invitation yeah yeah that's great and so the analysis presumably then was looking at this video footage and kind of um, marking the children's behaviors is that right yeah that's right and I would say that you know, I was thinking about how to describe this, probably painstaking is the word. So you um, watch videos back and there's some really nice sophisticated equipment that enables us to kind of slow down the videos and look really carefully at what's happening. Um, and we then do what we call coding, which is kind of um, annotating the video for different behaviours of interest or kind of um, speech or gestures that are indicating engagement in play. So we had three main headlines for that. The first one was um, what we called calls for attention. So that was one child saying to the other, oh, look at this. Hey, do you see that? Could be a point. Um, the second was around negotiation. So that bit we talked about at the beginning around uh, giving the instructions or making uh -huh. joint proposals. So, you know, let's pretend the lion escapes or you be the zookeeper and I'll be the naughty lion, uh, that kind of thing. Uh -huh. And then finally, the kind of... Um, really getting stuck in and enacting so um taking on that role pew, pew, i just shot the lion or something like that there's a lot of guns involved i have to say <laughs> interesting as a whole sub study mm -hmm. um and so so you you said there was i can't remember exactly but more than 200 kids in pairs right so that's yeah you know 10 minutes of footage for each pair of children so that's like a thousand minutes of footage or whatever. So how long yeah. did it take you to code all of that? Oh my goodness, that is a really good question. Um, at least a year, I think. Wow. So it's been wow. a really long-term investment in trying to understand this role of social play. And of yeah. course, um, when you're doing this kind of thing, you need to have a reliability check so it's not just one person's opinion about what's going on, but that you need to know that you've got a set of instructions that an independent person could look at the same footage and draw the same conclusions. Otherwise, it's not really valid to um, make any conclusions about. So it was quite an undertaking. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. I've done some video coding work, and it's it's <laughs> it's quite a commitment. And I've never done it with that volume of data before, especially when well, there's two children, right? Presumably, you're coding twice, once for each child, or are you coding always just the pair of children? No, no, we coded them separately precisely so that we could do this analysis that allowed us to look at the individual and the paired effect. Right, right, absolutely. Um, and so, yes, of course, so that that um, that was one of the points you emphasised right at the beginning, right? So it's about the paired effect, but how the two children are relating with each other that's driving mm -hmm. a lot of the complexity of the play, is that? Is that right? If I remember that. Yeah, right. I think that's that's a fair assessment. And what's quite interesting about that is um, people haven't really thought to do that before in play research of, with children this age. So mm -hmm. you look back at parent-child studies. There's quite a lot of um, sophisticated modelling that will account for that dependency of the mm -hmm. two actors um, or the two players in the game and how they influence one another. But when it gets to slightly older children. Um, there's a sort of very dominant individualistic model, mm -hmm. which tends to only look at individual skills, where actually the social context seems to be really important. Mm. And so what do you think that means in terms of what, we, what we're what we learning from this particular piece of research? And, and I guess the, um, 
the continuing work that you're doing? You know, what does that mean for how we're supporting children, whether in the home as, as parents or in a school setting or a nursery? I think it underscores the social nature of play and the fact that uh, children create meaning together. It might not necessarily be only in pairs, it might be broader groups, but I think that interaction is really critical and there might be different properties of that interaction and it might mean that um, individual children will behave quite differently when they're pairs um, with a different classmate or with a different friend mm. or when they're playing mm. with their siblings. So I think that's something for adults to be mindful of as a possible, um, you know, a possible thing to think about when they're thinking about who, who's doing which activity and who gets involved. And I think sometimes mixing it up could be quite helpful. And we didn't do that in this study, but as we go through the follow-ups, that's something that we'll look at. Um, how do um, how do behaviours change according to the change in partner? So at the moment we know that they do, but we haven't really got a good grasp on what those changes are and what they could mean. Mm. So I'm looking forward to investigating that more. Yeah, that's it's really interesting that, isn't it? Because for me, um, so at the at the South and Mind and Research Centre, we're really interested in sort of children with additional support needs or or special mm -hmm. educational needs, as you'd say in England. Um, and especially, you know, as a result of, of some kind of um, difficulty with learning. And particularly in the social domain, of course, one's often thinking about autism and the, the, the barriers that autistic kids can experience to kind of building, mm. fulfilling friendships and stuff like that. And, and one of the solutions has often been sort of buddy schemes, you know, the sort of pairing up with a kid in the class who's often you know normally a, a neurotypical kid who's perceived as being sort of having good social skills in inverted commas right whatever mm -hmm. that means um and i've often wondered you know is that really the playmate that that autistic child might have chosen for themselves mm -hmm. um and it, it you know it's sort of i think there's a big question mark over those sorts of approaches i don't know if you agree with that on the basis of what you've been doing? Yeah, probably not much to say on the basis of this study in particular, but other mm. research we've done looking at what it means to intervene in play and the kind of uh, issues that throws up, I think that's uh, a really interesting point. Because if you're going to play and you're going to forge a co social connection with someone, quite often the play activity or the thing you're interested in is going to be the, the mediating factor for that. So having a mm. common interest is probably going to be something that draws you in um, so that you're kind of engaged around that and you're building and sort of reinforcing social skills through that um, play activity rather than just having this sort of, I think I agree with you, it's a sort of simplistic uh, simplistic. Uh, approach to say well you're better at this so show show that person how to do it that's not right. cooperation of equals which is inherent to play um, so yeah. I think we could revisit those um, and think about sensitive matching based on um, skill levels interests and um, you know, just preferences really yeah absolutely I mean play surely has got to be about following your passions right for it to be mm -hmm. really fulfilling um, so, so uh, we've heard a bit about the fact that this is now a longitudinal study um, and you might look into varying the play partners. Um, so both of those, I think, are super cool and we'll maybe have to catch up with you again if this podcast continues yep. <laughs> beyond, <laughs> beyond the current crisis situation, we'll see. Um, so what, what I would like to ask you, though, finally, before we wrap up is, um, whether you've got any advice for people listening who are maybe kind of early career researchers, very aware of um, students whose learning has been disrupted or, you know, um, PhD students whose projects have been thrown up in the air and early career researchers maybe on short term contracts who are, mm -hmm. you know, in an extra anxious situation because of all of the disruption. So have you got any um, comforting words of wisdom for um for those people listening then we'd love to hear them i was thinking about this and i i think the main thing that comes to mind is that everyone's situation is very different so 
first of all, don't compare yourself to other people and think, oh, well, they've managed to get two papers out during the lockdown and, you know, I can barely get out of bed. I don't think that's helpful. And I think mm. everyone's got ups and downs and challenges. I certainly see that in my role as a PhD supervisor. All my students have been affected, but in very different ways. Mm. So you might not always see that as an individual. The second thing is to reach out to people for peer support. So um, I've done that to a couple of colleagues um, over this period when something's been a bit difficult and I haven't quite known what to do. I've just pinged an email off and said, you know, in lieu of a water cooler chat, can I just tell you about this that happened to me? And mm -hmm. it just made me feel so much more connected. Um, and that was really helpful as well. So I think people are very mindful of the difficult situations that each other are in and are quite willing to to listen and kind of engage with that. Certainly in my experience, uh, it's been um, very helpful to talk to colleagues that way. Mm. That's such a good piece of advice, I think, because it's relatively easy to reach out to set up a meeting about a sort of formal topic that needs a discussion. Mm. But you're right, missing that sort of chat in the kitchen while the kettle's boiling, you know, the sort of informal, just getting something off your chest that's been bothering you is, is yeah. you know, it's easy to, to forget that that's a big part of the value of, of being in a workplace together that we're now missing out on. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we will draw to a close there, if that's all right, Jenny. Um, sure, thank, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Really interesting work to talk about. Um, really important thinking about play um, right now. And for anyone listening, you'll be able to find out more about Jenny's work by following the links that we'll put up on the podcast page at um, ed.ac.uk forward slash Salverson dash research. Thank you very much, Jenny. Bye. Thanks, Lou. Bye. Bye. Okay, we did it. I thought that went quite smoothly. Thank you.